anywhere. The party's just begun. Happy New Year's 1991. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And today we are here to talk about the year that arguably did more to shape rock and metal than any other 12 month period. And that is 1991. In that summer and fall alone, we got albums from Nirvana, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Soundgarden, among others. And basically, in less than a year, music went from this to this. And it wasn't just those big albums. It was also Tupac, Ozzy, A Tribe Called Quest, and My Bloody Valentine, among many others. It seemed like something absolutely groundbreaking was coming out like every few weeks. And so if the 90s were the decade where pop culture shifted from the phoniness and materialism of the 80s and became darker, edgier, and more introspective, 1991 was the year that that transition happened. So what were the defining releases of 1991? And what are their lasting impact and influence? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also, I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. If you're busy this fall but still want to eat well, and you should, then check out Factor. They make nutritious, chef-prepared meals that are delivered straight to your door and are ready to eat in just two minutes. That means you can skip the trip to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And if you eat out a lot, it's also a great way to save money. It's way cheaper than takeout or worse, delivery, which as far as I'm concerned is a complete ripoff. And they also have a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is less than 550 calories per serving. They also have new lunch to go meals that are ready to eat with no microwave required and their fancy new surf and turf options. Personally, I love that I don't have to think about what to make for lunch. I can just pick something and I know that it's gonna taste good and that I'm still gonna hit my macro goals. So if you wanna check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. And to give some context for all of this, let me just briefly set the stage. To put it simply, mainstream music circa 1989 or 90 was, well, kind of corny. For example, one of the biggest songs of 1990 is this one where Paula Abdul is flirting with a rapping cartoon cat. And side note, I do kind of love Paula Abdul, but let's just call it what it is. We come together And in terms of metal, this era is the peak of stuff like White Snake, Poison, Warrant, and Motley Crue. And I say all of this to just sort of paint a picture so that you understand exactly how profound of a shift 1991 really was. The first bombshell to hit came in August with Metallica's Black Album featuring Inter Sandman as the lead single. And this album was a huge departure for the band. Their last album, And Justice For All, was this like massive sprawling epic of progressive thrash with several of the songs getting to be like seven, eight, even nine minutes long. But the Black Album was the exact opposite of that. It was the closest thing to like a pop version of thrash metal. They did a complete 180 and for this album it was all about these tight, focused songs with an emphasis on catchy choruses and vocal hooks for the first time in their career. As James Hetfield later said, we had pretty much done the longer song format to death. And Metallica was already a big band, for example, and Justice For All went to number six on Billboard. They were already headlining arenas. But this album took them and metal in general to a completely new level. Inter Sandman was the breakthrough single and the biggest song on the album. But I think what arguably did more for them was the ballad, Nothing Else Matters, which crossed over into a whole other audience, a little bit more mainstream that normally wouldn't pay any attention to a metal band. And I think that that song and that sort of crossover is a big part of what's made them into the just absolutely titanic juggernaut of a band they are now. And for me, I was in eighth grade at the time and the transformation was just obvious. Like a year earlier, the only people that I ever saw wearing Metallica shirts were those scary stoners that would skip school to smoke in the woods. But after the Black Album came out, even the relatively normal kind of popular girls wearing Metallica shirts. Kind of like now, only back then they actually listened to Metallica. Only three songs, how about I play them on guitar for you? 
Metal had officially become cool thanks to this album, and with the Black Album, Metallica officially entered the territory of these truly legendary bands like the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, to the point where this album actually re-entered the Billboard Top 10 as recently as 2020, 30 years after its release. And just a month later, we got Nevermind by Nirvana, featuring, of course, the lead single, Smells Like Teen Spirit. And you've probably heard a million people talk about how revolutionary this album was and how much Nirvana changed everything. And I can tell you that everything you have heard is true. It honestly did change music overnight, and I think we're still living in the post-Nirvana era. I think Nirvana's impact was to sort of hold up a mirror to that last decade of music and reveal it for what it always was. It had become really just kind of bloated, phony, and contrived, like Vanilla Ice, New Kids on the Block, Nelson. It was the McDonald's of music. And by contrast, Nirvana's music was ugly and gritty and raw. They dressed like dive bar customers who like just walked in off the street. Even when they were playing to tens of thousands of people in an arena, all of which probably doesn't sound that interesting today because tons of people do that. But at the time, it was an incredibly refreshing contrast to seeing like MC Hammer dancing around in his shiny gold parachute pants or Poison prancing around in lipstick. It felt real. It felt like they were just saying, you know what? Enough of the bullshit. And so ironically, by rejecting all of that rock star bullshit that we had come to expect, they actually became the biggest rock stars of their generation. And I would argue that to this day, every band that gets up on stage wearing jeans and a t-shirt is doing it indirectly at least because of Nirvana. And honestly, 1991 would have been a monumental year with just those two albums, but they were just the beginning. The next big release came in September with Guns N' Roses' Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 double album with the lead single, You Could Be Mine. And for lack of a better word, the release of this album just felt like an event. You Could Be Mine was also featured in Terminator 2, which was the biggest movie of the summer. Arnold Schwarzenegger himself was in the video at the peak of his stardom. On the show in the Ritz and then... You know, I guess Arnold was flying back from Congress and like, I want to be in the video. People were lining up at midnight to buy the albums. Finally, on September 17th, one and a half million fans across the country lined up at record stores to actually buy Use Your Illusion 1 and or 2. And Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 debuted at number 1 and number 2 on Billboard, respectively. It just felt really special in a way that very few album releases do, and it proved that even if Nirvana pretty much made hair metal obsolete overnight, which they did, Guns N' Roses still delivered a masterpiece with some of their most loved songs like Don't Cry and November Rain. And the conventional wisdom at the time was that those hair metal bands were just kind of a flash in the pan, and yeah, maybe they sold a lot of records, but could they really make music that would stand the test of time? Can they really make a statement? And I think that critique was probably true for at least 90% or more of the genre, but with these two albums, Guns N' Roses proved that they really transcended the genre of hair metal to the point where these days most people will argue that they were never even part of hair metal. And the following year, they kicked off a stadium tour of Metallica, which I remember really being like the concert event of the year. Like everybody at school wanted to go, not just the metal kids. And before I get to the next kind of big defining album of 1991, let me talk about a few of the albums that maybe aren't quite so well known, but still I think made a big impact. My Bloody Valentine put out Loveless, which wasn't particularly popular at the time, but I think since then has gone down as really like the definitive shoegaze album. And if anything, I would say that they're even more relevant now than they were in 1991, with shoegaze being one of the biggest trends in metal and rock. Smashing Pumpkins released their breakthrough album Gish, Ozzy Osbourne put out No More Tears, which revitalized his career, and really cemented his status as one of the biggest rock stars of all time who's been able to stay relevant regardless of what trends come and go, as well as kicking off the career of Tura released Arise, which in my personal opinion is one of the best thrash metal albums ever released, and in October, Death released Human, which really set a new standard for progressive metal thanks to the absolutely insane lineup of Sean and Paul from Cynic with Steve DiGiorgio from Sadus. Hip hop was also about to experience its own kind of tectonic shift with the release of Dr. Dre's The Chronic in 1992, but you could kind of see it coming in 1991. This was the debut of Tupac with his first album, Tupacalypse Now, and it's definitely not as good as his later material, but it did lay the groundwork for one of the single most important rappers of all time. And while gangster rap was gathering steam, at the same time, there was sort of a parallel movement which took hip hop in almost like the opposite direction, more intellectual and less violent. 
And 1991 brought us two very important albums in that part of hip hop, A Tribe Called Quest's Low End Theory and Daily Operation by Gangstar, both of which took kind of more of a chilled out jazzy approach. Surviving in the 90s is a must, so I trust that everyone listen up. Fugazi's Steady Diet of Nothing was also a landmark release for post-hardcore this year, and I think kind of laid the foundation for the emo explosion that was coming a decade later. And last but not least, R.E.M.'s Out of Time, which is a band you really don't hear people talk about much these days. When it comes to this era, grunge gets most of the attention, but I think what really set the stage for grunge and alternative rock in general was the college rock scene of the late 80s with bands like the B-52s, the Pixies, and of course, R.E.M. R.E.M.'s Out of Time was the commercial high water mark for college rock, with Losing My Religion hitting number four on Billboard and becoming a certified mainstream crossover hit. That's me in the spot, like losing my religion. And I could keep going pretty much forever with the sort of lesser known albums, but that brings us to the next big album I want to focus on, 10 by Pearl Jam. Their breakthrough song was Jeremy, which was about a high school student who tragically took his own life in front of his classmates, which might seem like a fairly normal topic these days, but that was pretty emotionally intense stuff for 1991, considering that just a few months earlier, Vanilla Ice was at the top of the charts. And in spite of the sort of dark subject matter, or actually maybe because of it, the video became a hit on MTV and Pearl Jam blew up shortly after Nirvana. And this album eventually went on to sell over 15 million copies worldwide, which might be kind of surprising to some people because I've noticed something interesting. You really never hear Pearl Jam's name come up these days in the context of grunge or really at all, but at their peak around maybe 1993, my estimation is that they were actually a little bit more popular than Nirvana, although I have never once heard a musician named Pearl Jam as an influence. In any case, the point here is that this was the second multi-platinum grunge album of the year, and we are not even done yet. Which brings us to Blood Sugar Sex Magic by Red Hot Chili Peppers, which came out on the exact same day as Nevermind by Nirvana. That is how just absolutely insane the release schedule was this year. Red Hot Chili Peppers have been kind of flirting with mainstream success for years, most recently with their previous album Mother's Milk and their cover of Higher Ground by Stevie Wonder, which was kind of like a minor hit in the alternative rock world. But this album is what turned them into certified household names, in particular the second single Under the Bridge, which is about Anthony Kiedis' struggle with addiction. I don't ever want They got Rick Rubin on board as the producer for this album, as well as a big budget to go record in this supposedly haunted Hollywood mansion for months. And all that effort clearly paid off. To me, this is the album that they had been working their whole career to make, and in my personal opinion, it's a masterpiece. It's one of those rare albums that feels like a cohesive piece of work, but at the same time, every song really stands on its own and has its own identity. For example, like one of my favorite little details is the stereo drum tracks that only appear in Power of Equality, where Chad Smith literally doubled the drums, and if you know anything about recording, that's a very weird, difficult thing to do. And this album set the stage for them to be arguably the most successful alternative rock band of all time. They've been on top of the Billboard charts and festival lineups for the entire 30 years since this album came out. And last but not least, Bad Motor Finger by Soundgarden in October. And I consider their success to be maybe the most unexpected out of all the grunge bands. They started out their career on SST Records, which was Greg Ginn from Black Flag's label. And they were always kind of a little bit weirder than the rest of the pack. They were probably the best overall musicians in the genre. And this album is pretty weird even by today's standards. As the Seattle Times put it, Bad Motor Finger is art metal mastery, heavily dosed with tales, psychedelic leads, free jazz freakouts, odd time signatures, and alternate tunings. As a few examples of that, Rusty Cage is in this weird drop B tuning, alternating between measures of 3 4 and 5 4. And Outshined is in 7 4. And so they were this kind of artsy metal band with these super down-tuned sludgy riffs and these seven-minute songs. And yet somehow they were all over MTV, rock radio, and eventually went double platinum with this album. And I think that the success of this album is kind of a microcosm of the 90s in general. 
I recognize that it's entirely possible that I'm looking back on all of this with rose-tinted glasses and sort of deluding myself with nostalgia because I was a teenager in the 90s and I remember all of these albums coming out, but I really do think this year was something special. I think it was the turning point when the 90s really became the 90s, when pop culture in general got weird, edgy, and dark. 1992 continued that trend in music with Dr. Dre's The Chronic, which changed hip hop forever by making gangster rap the dominant subgenre, which it still is today. Bands like Rage Against the Machine and Pantera blew up, who were absolutely a product of the 90s, with a modern, fresh take that just couldn't have existed in the 80s. And later in the decade, movies like Natural Born Killers, Seven, and Pulp Fiction did the same thing to film. Designers like David Carson did it with visual art. But in my personal opinion, it all started with the music of 1991. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon. Patrons get access to every one of my videos and podcasts a week early. I do giveaways. There's members-only channels on my Discord that I'm super active in. There's even a way to have me review your music. So if that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.